A measure of effect size is exactly what it says on the tin. It is a measure of the size of the effect. What effect? The effect that this drug had on lowering blood pressure. How many points did blood pressure drop based on using this drug? You can't get that answer from statistical hypothesis inference testing. You can, however, get that answer from an effect size. So let's review. When we do hypothesis testing, significance reports the probability that we would find these results, the ones that we found, if the null hypothesis was true. And we determined that the null hypothesis is never actually true. And really what we are measuring with a p-value is a measure of chance, the likelihood of finding this particular outcome. Less than five times in a hundred would we find this outcome by chance. What we get with an effect size is a standardized measure of the mean difference. The difference between the sample mean and the population mean. The difference between the experimental group mean and the control group mean. The mean difference is the size of the effect. And by standardizing that mean difference, we can allow for objective evaluation of the size of the effect. We can compare an effect size between studies in a way that we simply can't do with p-values. We can combine effect sizes from multiple studies because the effect size is answering the question, how big is the effect? One of the most common statistical tests that you will do is a t-test. It's comparing the difference between two samples, or perhaps the same sample being measured before and after. And the measure for effect size is Cohen's D. It was designed by Jacob Cohen and written about in his book, Statistical Power Analysis for the Behavioral Sciences. For each of the hypothesis tests that I'm going to teach you about, I'm going to show you how to calculate an effect size. Once you know how to calculate an effect size, it's important that we know how to interpret those effect sizes. I've told you that effect sizes are comparable, so we need some kind of convention by which we can make that interpretation. Jacob Cohen included a table of these conventions for interpretation in his book. And those conventions were expanded upon by another researcher named Sobolowski. Let's take a look at that table of how we could interpret effect sizes. Cohen's interpretations are in bold. A small effect size is a 0.2. A medium is a 0.5. And a large is a 0.8. Sobolowski has added a very small effect size of 0.1. Effect sizes of 1.2 are very large. And if your effect size is two or larger, that is a huge effect size. Now, as you are doing your interpretation, you might wonder, where do these conventions come from? That 0.2 and 0.5, that seems a little arbitrary. And in fact, Jacob Cohen would agree with you. He wrote that all conventions are arbitrary. One can only demand of them that they not be unreasonable. And in fact, these conventions are usable because they're not unreasonable. We're not going to quibble between an effect size of 0.49 and 0.5. Is it small or medium? We're just going to report effect sizes for what they are. We're not bound to these conventions. They just give us guidelines to help understand what those effect sizes mean. I'm going to teach you how to calculate effect sizes, but when you're on your own, why should you report an effect size? I'm going to make the case that when you calculate a p-value, you should always calculate a measure of effect size. But why? Let's start with this. It's as simple as, because I said so. Well, not me, really, but the American Psychological Association. According to the APA manual, we should always report a measure of effect size for all statistical tests, especially 
when those tests are statistically non-significant because the effect size will make the interpretation of those tests more useful. Well, maybe you're skeptical and because I said so isn't good enough. All right, let me continue to build this case based on the mathematics. Let's say that we're doing a pilot study. We're testing a new drug. We haven't rolled it out to a large group of people yet. We're still doing preliminary testing. In other words, the results that we're getting are not intended to generalize to the population. They're simply giving us an indication of how well this drug works. When we are doing small scale pilot testing, a p-value doesn't tell us anything useful. We're not making those kinds of comparisons. Therefore, when we're doing small scale testing where generalization is not important, we'll not report a p-value. Instead, we will report the effect size. That effect size can then be used to conduct a power analysis, which we will use to determine how large of a sample we need to recruit when we do our null hypothesis statistical testing. We can determine the size of our sample from the effect size. And this can save us time and money and prevent waste, especially if we're doing studies with lab rats or other animal studies. Another reason why we should always report effect size is if our sample size is small. You are doing a study with a very small number of patients who have a very rare disease. You can't recruit a large number. You're left with the number that you have. Because your sample size is small, it is very likely that you will not find statistically significant differences in the study that you're doing. When a sample size is small, null hypothesis statistical testing confuses non-significance with an absence of effect. Because the results are non-significant, the drug must not have worked. No, not at all. The drug worked and we can show how big of an effect this drug had by reporting the effect size. On the other hand, sometimes you're doing research with a huge sample size, 2,000, 3,000 people. When you have a large sample size, every statistical test, no matter how tiny the mean difference, will be statistically significant because sample size drives significance. If sample size is large, every null hypothesis statistical test will be statistically significant, even if the effect size is trivial. And just like with small sample sizes, non-significance can be confused with no effect. In large samples, statistical significance can be confused with a meaningful effect, even though the actual effect size is trivial. Therefore, if you are using a large sample size, you should always report an effect size along with your probability value. Hopefully, I've made a compelling case for you. No matter what type of study you are doing, if you report a p-value, there is no reason why you should fail to report an effect size. I told you that effect sizes can be compared, but what about p-values? Can those be compared? Like if one test is significant and the other test is non-significant, does the significant test mean that that intervention worked where the non-significant test didn't? That's what we're going to answer next.